Good evening. I'm Noel Latif, President of the Foreign Policy Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this session of FPA Live. Our guest today is Dr. David Denoon, Professor of Politics and Economics at New York University, where he is Director of the NYU Center on US-China Relations. Dr. Denoon is the author of numerous books on China, including a three volume series on the United States and China and the future of Central Asia, Southeast Asia and Latin America, as well as China, contemporary political, economic and international affairs. He's written a very well received book on uh, relations between China and India. And his most recent book, which we will be discussing today is China's Grand Strategy a Roadmap to Global Power, question mark, published by New York University Press and available now. The book has received very positive reviews and has been described as a thorough and superb synopsis uh, with seasoned scholars providing a wide ranging set of assessments on different dimensions and global regions in China's foreign relations. Another reviewer states, quote, this book avoids ideological demagoguery and deals with the emerging realities as China consolidates its place as a major player in world affairs, end of quote. Dave, may I begin by asking you to give us a thumbnail sketch of your new book, China's Grand Strategy? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you, Noel, for hosting this evening and for arranging uh, us to connect with uh, your viewers. Uh, I think this is obviously uh, a topic which is very timely. Uh, the question uh, is whether um, many countries have a grand strategy. I think there's no doubt that the Chinese do. So that's one quick answer to your question. Uh, but second, I think it's important to know what some of the key elements are. So I'll just identify a few of them and then we can go into them in greater detail. Uh, the first is that over time, uh, as the Communist Party of China uh, has gotten more confident, it's shifted its focus from defense to, to beginning to project power. So for example, in the first 50 years after they came to power, uh, their focus was on tr China's traditional uh, opponents, uh, the Mongols, the Manchus from the north, uh, and then at the turn of the 20th century, the Russians, and then finally, of course, uh, in the 1930s and 40s, the Japanese. So the Chinese looked at that, uh, and when Mao came to power, the first focus was on shoring up their defenses. Uh, what's changed now, and the reason this book uh, uh, was written, is that uh, the economic surge in China over the last 40 years, since Deng Xiaoping started the reforms, uh, has led to a vast increase in the resources available to the government. And that's led to an increase in both conventional and nuclear forces, which we can talk about in more detail uh, if you'd like. So the first thing is the shift from defense to offense uh, or defense to at least projecting power. Uh, the second element is looking uh, at uh, the question of how to project power uh, and what the combination is of economics and military elements. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, and what has happened uh, since that was announced uh, is also a very sharp increase in the number of uh, overseas commitments that China has made. These are not only economic, but also military. Uh, and I think uh, as the discussion tonight develops, we'll go into this in greater detail. But as we look around the periphery of China, from South Korea to Japan, to Southeast Asia, to South Asia, and also now Central Asia, uh, I think you'll see that in each of these areas, China has expanded its influence and uh, there's no question that that's part of it. its basic uh, long-term direction. I think also it's pretty clear 
that when the Chinese announced that they intend to be the world's preeminent power by 2149, the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party coming to power, that they have that uh, as their central goal. The, the final element, which I think is important, is to note that um, Deng Xiaoping, uh, when he was uh, general secretary, uh, was urging China to uh, hide its capabilities and bide its time, be, go about things in a careful, slow way. And you may remember that there was a great deal of discussion about China having a, quote, peaceful rise. Since 2008, when the financial crisis in the West took place, however, China has been willing to take stronger stands and has uh, led to an, a number of situations where it's antagonized its neighbors, which we'll get into in, in our discussion. So not only have the China shifted from defense to projecting power, they've projected power through both economics and military means, but they're now also willing to get pushback from countries uh, if they think something is important to achieve. So for example, right now, the Chinese are uh, doing these overflights, uh, invading airspace of Taiwan, uh, which they know irritates the Taiwanese and upsets many of the neighboring countries, but they're doing it because they wanna project uh, their power. And uh, so I think these are the, the broad themes of the book uh, and we can go into details if you'd like. Matthew Pottinger, a senior official uh, on the National Security Council during the Trump administration and architect of the uh, Trump administration's approach to China has said that uh, US policy towards China uh, has hardly changed uh, since uh, the Biden administration has come into office. Uh, President Biden has himself spoken of quote, unquote, uh, extreme competition with China and his coordinator for Indo-Pacific affairs has proclaimed that, quote, the period that was broadly described as engagement has come to an end, uh, end of quote. What in your estimation should President Biden be doing differently, uh, if anything, uh, than his predecessor uh, in dealing with relations with China? Well, um, one set of issues is <clears throat> what I would call the sort of uh, tactics of diplomacy, sort of how to go about it, what's the best way to achieve your results. Uh, in many ways, uh, President Trump was willing to challenge the conventional wisdom about how to deal with China, uh, and he succeeded. And what Pottinger is uh, citing there is that in, the Biden administration has continued many of the basic uh, themes of Trump's policy. Uh, but uh, it was, as in many aspects of Trump's uh, behavior, the manner in which he did things that antagonized people. Uh, on the other hand, I would say <clears throat> that the Biden administration has given off mixed messages. Uh, the person you cited is named Kurt Campbell, uh, and he was one of the key people to begin uh, sort of questioning the in engagement strategy which has been the centerpiece uh, for both Republican and Democratic administrations for more than 20 years. Uh, so uh, he deserves a lot of credit for raising those issues uh, and having the fortitude to get the forest policy establishment to think about it. Uh, but there are others uh, around the president who I think want to take a much softer line. And so for example, last week, uh, apparently, the Biden administration <clears throat> agreed to let the uh, chief financial officer of Huawei, uh, who's the daughter of the chairman, uh, go back to China. Uh, it looks like she's getting a relatively soft deal. I would say that's different than Trump. I think Trump was on the right track in terms of dealing with Huawei. Uh, the way I would confirm that is that uh, even the Bloomberg News uh, has a recent article saying that the Trump administration uh, was able to get a significant, uh, let's say, pressure or cross pressure on Huawei, uh, which doesn't look like the Biden administration is doing. So I'd like to see the Biden administration 
take a tougher line in that regard. Uh, I also think that at the meeting in Alaska, where the top Biden administration officials, the Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor met uh, with uh, the Chinese uh, foreign minister, uh, they uh, were not able to really project a coherent policy. Uh, I, I think this reflects some differences between them and possibly Kirk Campbell. So I would say the Biden administration needs to have a more consistent uh, presentation of its basic ideas. If the ideas are going to be reflecting the direction that Campbell was urging, then I think it will be similar to Trump and, and in many ways I would support it. <clears throat> if it's not going to, uh, then it's not clear where it's going. Former uh, Treasury Secretary Larry Summers uh, observed that a pragmatic approach to bilateral relations with China would be well advised in light of the growing number of global challenges uh, that require the cooperation of China, including climate change uh, and, and, and global health issues. Uh, can we manage competition with China so as to leave the door open uh, for cooperation on these critical issues? Uh, I think we can, uh, as long as China doesn't uh, take any direct military moves that require our response. Uh, so, for example, if China just continues to violate Taiwan's airspace, uh, and it, it's a nuisance, that's one thing. If they actually go farther uh, and uh, were to initiate some kind of uh, contact or conflict, uh, then we're, we will have to respond. And that would be an unfortunate development and could escalate into further problems. So I would say I definitely support uh, Summers' position. Uh, also, he's had the courage, even though identified with the Clinton administration, uh, and Obama administration uh, as well uh, to say that uh, the uh, economic policy and economic uh, strategy which the Biden administration is pushing uh, is going to uh, create greater inflation and greater problems. So I think what Summers is getting at is that uh, it's important that the administration be consistent across all areas. And so uh, I think we'll probably know in the next week or so where the budget situation stands. But uh, if the Congress rejects the more, um, let's say, uh, Keynesian aspects of what uh, Biden is proposing, uh, then uh, I think that means there will be a, uh, a much greater chance of uh, getting uh, bipartisan support for what Biden wants to do. Uh, in the uh, special edition of uh, Great Decisions uh, that was issued last year to which you uh, made a terrific contribution, uh, Bill Burns observed, uh, quote, in recent decades, undisciplined thinking led us to assume too much about the benefits of engaging with China. Today, undisciplined thinking of a different sort is causing us to assume too much about the feasibility of decoupling and containment and about the inevitability of confrontation. Preventing China's rise is beyond America's capacity and our economies are too entangled to decouple." End of quote. Uh, Dave, how would you advise US business leaders to view their existing business activities in China, uh, as well as any additional direct foreign investment in China? Well, um, first of all, I, I don't accept the, the premise of Burns's comment. Uh, I think actually decoupling, or at least elements of decoupling, are likely to reduce friction rather than increase friction. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, in the higher tech areas where China has uh, been um, clearly uh, pilfering uh, American technology without paying for it, there's a great deal of bitterness and resentment in the business community. And so that is actually leading to a reduction in things like joint ventures. It's led to a significant reduction in direct uh, foreign investment from the US. 
uh, and we're in a situation where uh, the Chinese uh, are trying to figure out uh, whether they really have to make concessions. So this is similar to the, this, the split between Kurt Camel and some other members in the Biden administration. Uh, if you, and I would, from this quote at least, I'd put Burns on the side uh, opposing what Campbell is advocating. So uh, th this, these kinds of differences early in administration are very common. Uh, I would argue that uh, I completely agree that the two societies cannot completely decouple and there's no reason to. Uh, in in low-tech areas like uh, assembly of, of uh, components and things like that, uh, there's no reason to have decoupling. But in some of the higher tech areas, particularly uh, where we have major research facilities in China, uh, this means that the Chinese get that information uh, at the same time that uh, American firms are generating those ideas. Uh, and I think we have to be in a stronger position for bargaining. And that's one thing that the Trump administration succeeded at. And I think Kurt Campbell would advocate that. So I guess my view would be that American business uh, needs to consider uh, holding back and bargaining at, in a tougher way uh, about uh, trying to get uh, sufficient uh, protection for intellectual property and also uh, for uh, the uh, operations uh, in China. Th this has been a big debate, particularly in the financial community and as you know, many of the big money management firms uh, are recently uh, continuing to uh, want to invest in China. Uh, if, in fact, uh, Xi Jinping uh, continues to take a relatively uh, tough stand on the business community in China, uh, I think American investors are going to be more cautious. So I think decoupling will not be seen as uh, such a radical position in another year or two. Henry Kissinger uh, has said that we are in the foothills of a cold war with China. Uh, my esteemed colleague uh, Ian Bremer uh, of the Eurasia Group, on the other hand, uh, views the cold war scenario uh, as implausible uh, because uh, the US and China are both turning more inward and are therefore unlikely to have a a clash of global aspirations. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I think we, Kissinger is right. Uh, I think we are on the edge of a potential Cold War, but there's no reason for things to tip into that uh, if uh, pragmatic decisions are made. Uh, so for example, uh, to go back to uh, high-tech uh, research and operations, uh, the US leads in high tech uh, and even on, uh, most people don't realize this, but even on something like the fifth generation uh, telecommunications equipment, the US uh, has uh, been the source of many of the new ideas. Uh, however, it's been uh, the Chinese, particularly with Huawei and to some extent ZTE, uh, who have been successful at uh, manufacturing these products uh, in an efficient way. So I would say that to avoid uh, having a direct and open Cold War, uh, we need to agree on uh, how uh, our technology is gonna be protected. Uh, if the Chinese are not willing to do it, then I think there's gonna be greater tension. I think they're showing signs that they want to, and certainly uh, the, the fact that uh, Huawei has suffered so much because it's not been able to get the semiconductors at once uh, is a, a sign that withholding technology works as a bargaining tool. So I would say use it as a bargaining tool. Don't use it as the ultimate weapon. If, if you're trying to close down Chinese firms, then obviously that's going to be close to uh, a, a direct legal challenge. What we need to do is have them recognize that we want them to change their behavior. The Economist cover on May 1st of this year 
proclaimed Taiwan, quote, the most dangerous place on earth. Do you agree with this assessment? No, I don't. Uh, I actually think that the Chinese are very unlikely to invade Taiwan uh, because they don't need to. Uh, Taiwan uh, is willing to cooperate in many areas with China. Uh, a lot of the Chinese business community is supplemented by Taiwanese. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, the leading manufacturer of semiconductor chips, uh, has big operations in China as well as in Taiwan. Uh, and so uh, they're, the Chinese uh, are quite capable of getting the main thing that they want from Taiwan. Uh, it is a mistake, I think, however, for Xi Jinping to uh, keep proclaiming that this has to be settled while he's in office. And when he says this has to be settled, he means uh, the, the political status of Taiwan. So I think if Xi Jinping would back off this, take a slightly lower keyed position, uh, then uh, the entire situation would calm down. Uh, and if China were to invade Taiwan, uh, it would uh, destroy its reputation there would be, of course, sanctions. Uh, there might be an escalating war. Uh, also, uh, I'll, I'll note that many uh, well-informed analysts have pointed out that invading Taiwan is not a simple proposition. Uh, it took the largest armada in that man has ever assembled to go the 20 some miles of the uh, English Channel and, and get into uh, France and D-Day to go 100 miles, four times as far, when the Chinese do not have complete uh, air cover uh, is uh, a much riskier proposition. Also, the, the beaches uh, in Taiwan are as non-existent as Omaha Beach was in Normandy. And so uh, the Chinese would have a very tough time actually landing. Uh, so uh, I think the, the chance that they would try an invasion uh, that might fail is extremely low. Now, would they do this possibly in 20 or 30 years? Uh, if nothing changes, if Taiwan doesn't build up its defenses, if people don't rally to Taiwan's support, that could happen. But I don't, I don't see it happening now. Now, what the, the proposition that the economist is putting forward was that, that Taiwan is a dangerous place because of the environment. And I would say, again, that's not true at all. Uh, I think that the leadership on Taiwan uh, has been quite pragmatic, very calm, uh, has not been uh, flamboyant in any way. So I, I would say uh, this is the kind of thing that journalists do when they want to get excitement, but it, it's not uh, necessarily an accurate description of the situation. Turning to the uh, South China Sea, uh, how will modernization of the uh, Australian Navy affect uh, the balance of power in the region? Well, uh, it's going to have an enormous effect. Um, the reason is that uh, a very substantial part of the fuel oil uh, and uh, hydrocarbons that come into China, but both the natural gas and fuel oil, uh, go through the South China Sea. And uh, if the Australians are able to supplement the American uh, nuclear force in that area, uh, it will make it much less likely that China would actually engage in a military conflict. So I think the submarines will uh, not only improve the military balance, but give people confidence. Also, because Australia is a small uh, state and clearly not a threat to anyone, uh, it makes it puts the Australia in a position of providing a balancing role. And th this leads to the broader proposition of the Quad. The Quad is India, Australia, Japan, and the US. And if the, the Quad states can cooperate, uh, they can provide a good balance uh, to uh, whatever the Chinese are doing. So I would say the submarines will increase stability. Uh, and uh, they will uh, make the continuation of a trade, even in crisis situations, more likely. And how do you see relations between China and India evolving? 
Well, this is very fraught relationship. Uh, it's fraught over uh, a number of factors. Uh, one set of factors is just territory. Uh, the territory itself is not that important, uh, but it's become symbolic. Uh, the debates really come out of the 19th century uh, where uh, various British surveyors were surveying essentially the borderline between the British Empire uh, and China. Uh, and uh, the Chinese never formally agreed to that. Uh, and uh, the Kashmir uh, dust up of 1962 was one example of that. But even uh, as recently as 18 months ago, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, and Indians were uh, at each other's throats uh, over some desolate uh, territory uh, north of Bangladesh, uh, which is called uh, Haryana uh, Pradesh by the Indians. And it's called uh, part of uh, Tibet and part of uh, Xinjiang by the Chinese. So the uncertainty over how to resolve that uh, is one key element. But the broader issue is that China has moved far ahead of India economically and India needs to open up its economy to be able to compete. Uh, and it looks like the Indians have begun to recognize that. Uh, so I think the combination of India joining the Quad and possibly uh, liberalizing its economy will, will speed up India's growth, uh, make India a better uh, balancer for China. Uh, so in that, again, I would say uh, is probably going to be more uh, sympathetic, uh, more, um, let's say, uh, likely, more congenial uh, to produce uh, a positive outcome. Uh, th there's nothing to be gained by either country fighting or, or debating over these desolate pieces of territory way up in the Himalayas. If you've ever seen pictures of them there, they're extremely dry. Uh, there's not adequate water. Uh, all the provisions need to be hauled up these mountainsides for these desolate places. I can't imagine what it would be like to be assigned uh, as a soldier into one of those locations. So uh, I think if both sides could agree to back down, uh, we would all be in better shape. Are we at risk uh, with our current policies uh, towards China of encouraging greater uh, rapprochement between China and Russia? That's a possibility, but um, in the same way that uh, there's sort of deep and fundamental tensions between India and China, uh, China and Russia uh, have a series of uh, sort of uh, neuralgia, I would call it. Uh, which has lasted a long time and which isn't going to go away easily. Uh, also, it's, at the moment, you have uh, a very activist uh, leader of Russia, Putin, uh, who wants to get uh, cooperation with China and to have a, a sort of quasi-alliance. Uh, it's not clear to me that the next leader of Russia will have the same set of objectives. So if Putin were to be a president for another decade, uh, then I would say, yes, there's a greater possibility of cooperation. If Putin were to leave the scene sooner, you might well have another leader who didn't think that was as important. The same thing would be true in China. If Xi Jinping for some reason were to leave uh, earlier than is now expected, uh, I think the Chinese might well quit worrying about that. The reason they're worried about it is because of the length of the border with Russia uh, and the fact that the Russians have a long history of contesting that. And of course, the, the original triangulation that Nixon and Kissinger proposed uh, was designed to uh, put enough uncertainty uh, in the minds of the, the leadership in Moscow uh, about whether the US could cooperate with China that a, that a triangular balance was established. Uh, I think that that, is definitely to our advantage. So uh, to come back to the, the essence of the question, uh, if the US can continue to establish uh, uh, close uh, working relationships with China on other areas, 
uh, that will create the kind of uncertainty that will make a Russian-China alliance less likely. Does uh, China's grand strategy uh, have long-term viability? Uh, what do you think of the commentary in Foreign Policy magazine that China is, quote, uh, uh, a, a declining power, uh, end of quote? Um, well, I guess like my comment about the Economist uh, article, uh, I don't think China is declining. I don't, I don't think that's an accurate assumption. Uh, I think there are elements about China's sort of structure uh, which could lead to decline. Uh, one, of course, which is widely discussed is demography uh, because of the one-child policy. Uh, the uh, population is rapidly aging and very soon uh, China will have more people over 60 than any other country in the world. Uh, and so uh, they, and they do not have a well thought out uh, policy for how to deal with the aging population. In the past, this is always the responsibility of the eldest son in the Chinese family. In today's world, where not only families are smaller, but because of the one child policy, there may not even be a son. Uh, it's not clear who is gonna take care of these people. And there are very sad stories about a very high suicide rate among uh, uh, parents and grandparents who are left alone in villages. So uh, the Chinese are definitely worried about that. But the broader issue is that um, they are going to have to allocate resources to uh, elder care, which they don't have to do now. Uh, and China, over the last 40 years, has had a very favorable ratio of workers to retirees. As that ratio changes, uh, it's going to be much less uh, manageable. So that, that's one big issue. The other issue, which uh, is touched on every once in a while, but not sufficiently, are the environmental issues. Uh, China has really devastated the quality of its water, its rivers, many of its forests. Uh, and uh, though Xi Jinping has actually done some positive things in this area, uh, they haven't done enough. Uh, and if they don't uh, make really uh, major efforts in the next decade, uh, they're going to have even bigger problems. So, that, so there's no question that China has I, what economists call sort of structural problems that, that need to be addressed. But is that going to make China collapse? No. Uh, it, it may make the quality of life uh, less attractive. And that quality isn't very high right now. Uh, I find I'm unwilling to go to China in the fall where the, where the smog is, is so awful. Uh, the last time I was in China, I was there for 10 days in the fall. I never saw the outline of the sun. The, the smog was so thick, you couldn't even see the outline of the sun. So that kind of, uh, of environmental situation is deeply troubling and uh, needs to be dealt with. Uh, returning to China's grand strategy, uh, how, how is that viewed by its uh, immediate neighbors? Uh, uh, in, in uh, Northeast Asia, uh, Vietnam, uh, the Republic of Korea and Japan. Does the road to Korean reunification uh, run through Beijing? Well, the Chinese would like to think so, uh, but the North Koreans keep disabusing of that. Uh, the North Koreans are very hard to predict. Uh, as difficult as we find them to deal with in negotiations, the Chinese uh, feel the same way. Uh, if you meet privately with Chinese, they will complain Im immediately about the difficulty of even figuring out what North Korean strategy is. Uh, so I would say uh, there's no question that uh, North Korea poses a real dilemma. Uh, South Korea, uh, the Chinese have antagonized, however, because the Chinese uh, have been boycotting uh, Korean goods. They've been boycotting uh, uh, Hyundai automobiles. They've been boycotting uh, Samsung iPhones and think, or, or phones uh, because uh, the Koreans are, South Koreans are going ahead with uh, the deployment of uh, defensive missiles. 
uh, the THAAD system, the theater high altitude area defense system. And that's uh, created a lot of friction between them. And I, I don't see that friction going away. Uh, also, uh, much the same way that uh, in Europe, people joke that the, the, the French love Germany so much that they wanted to have two Germanys. Uh, many of G Korea's neighbors are quite happy to see two Koreas. So I, I doubt if Korea will uh, be unified anytime soon. Um, I'd like to go back to uh, the business environment uh, and uh, of late, uh, the Chinese government has, has upended predictability within uh, the, the, uh, the, the business environment in China. Uh, do you think President Xi will continue to uh, rein in China's largest uh, corporations? It's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, some people think that this is mostly political, meaning that uh, President Xi was worried that the heads of these large and successful Chinese companies would be a direct challenge to the Communist Party. Uh, and the, therefore, uh, he was willing to trim them back, uh, even though they were uh, sources of great pride to younger Chinese. Uh, among my graduate students, uh, the leaders of these corporations are in many ways role models that they uh, have a great deal of respect for. So for she to uh, not only trim them back, but in some cases uh, put them under essentially house arrest uh, has been very unsettling to the elite population in China. Uh, my hunch is that, uh, however, it's more fundamental and she actually gave a speech after he was re-nominated uh, uh, to become president for a second term. Uh, and if you look at the journal, which is called Seeking Truth, Qi uh, in November of 17, right after he was re-nominated, you can see a relatively long speech. The speech is available in English now, uh, but you can see uh, him sort of uh, get, giving uh, sort of a foreshadowing of this turn to the left. Uh, one in greater equality uh, of wealth, greater equality of opportunity. So something like cutting back on tutoring, uh, which wealthy families can do and poor families can't, uh, is, is very popular. Uh, cutting back on the behavior of uh, some of the uh, leaders of the large corporations is also politically popular. Uh, it's very similar to the muckraking era in this country. Uh, but the, the question is, is that really the motivation? If, if the true motivation is to have a more egalitarian society, then I think she will have succeeded. Uh, but it's not clear that that is the motivation. And it'll take us a while to figure out. But some of these corporations like Evergrande, the, the big property company, which is on the verge of bankruptcy, and HNA, which is a sort of multi-purpose conglomerate. Uh, these companies uh, are obviously overextended, uh, and uh, but it, it's important to note that it was the Chinese state banks that funded these companies to allow them to do the mergers that they did. Uh, so uh, in a way, uh, I'm looking next to see whether uh, Xi Jinping replaces the head of some of the state banks, because the state banks uh, essentially permitted this activity by uh, giving credit lines to these big companies. Uh, finally, can I ask you, Dave, how you view the uh, Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, is it a benign extension of uh, China's extraordinary economic development? Uh, or is it uh, integral to China's grand strategy? Oh, absolutely, it's integral to its grand strategy. Uh, I would not say there's anything benign at all about it. Uh, it's very definitely designed to link these countries uh, with China. Uh, let me give you an example. If you look at the gas and oil pipeline that is in Burma, it goes from Sitwe uh, down near Bangladesh, diagonally across Burma, 
and up to Kunming in China. If you look at that pipeline, you can see two things. Uh, not only is it critical for China's uh, having a source of oil that doesn't have to go through the Malacca Strait, so it has a military component, uh, but uh, because it goes diagonally across virtually all of Burma, uh, it allows the Chinese to operate all along this pipeline. It allows them to bring in intelligence operatives, bring in uh, undercover agents and so on, and to strengthen their ties with the people in Burma who want to support China. So uh, I would say if you lo looked at the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka, the Gwadar port in Pakistan, uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, all of these activities uh, are at least as much military as economic. Uh, and the Hembantota port uh, is seen as a particularly uh, noxious example because uh, the port of Colombo was already being expanded. Uh, Hembantota has never paid for itself. And now uh, the Sri Lankan government is in grave trouble trying to pay off its debts. And they ended up giving the Chinese a hundred year lease on the property uh, in exchange for having the Chinese take back some of the debt. So uh, I think uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is at least as much a security enterprise as an economic one. And in some cases, there may be wise projects that are being funded, but in many cases, they're, they're more for political and security reasons. Well, uh, in talking with you today, uh, Dave, I'm uh, reminded of President Kennedy's uh, toast at a White House dinner uh, in honor of a group of uh, Nobel Prize laureates. Uh, uh, President Kennedy said, uh, I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent, of human knowledge that has ever been gathered together at the White House, uh, with the possible exception of when uh, Dave Denoom dined alone. Uh, uh, again, the, the book uh, edited by Dave Denoom on China's grand strategy uh, uh, is entitled uh, China's Grand Strategy, A Roadmap to Global Power. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dave, uh, and thank you uh, to our audience uh, for joining us on FPA Live. Thank you, Noel.